All righty. Okay. Let's double check that. I'm going to go over and double check it over there. See it? Huh? Yeah. Okay. All right, I'm gonna. Yeah. <laughs> hey, everybody. We're just going live a little early, so everybody gets a chance to get on. So, welcome all. Okay, let's see. I'm gonna go here. Welcome everybody. Sorry, we're just getting on a little bit. Give people a chance to get online. Get on the train. Okay, I've got that. Muted. All right. I think we're good. Okay. Morning, everyone. The sun's shining. It's another day. We prayed for this. <laughs> All right. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our Sunday morning live stream. Uh, let's start with a scripture reading. This is Colossians chapter 1, one of the writings of Paul the Apostle. Speaking of Jesus, he says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth. Visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. You know, when I read passages like that, sometimes I ask my heart, tell me why you're anxious again? You know, when we remember who he is, it tells us a lot about who we are and what we are and how we are. And so we rejoice today as we gather around our computers and as we gather around the word of God, um, we remember Christ and uh, let the eyes of our hearts be lifted to him and walk by faith and not by sight. So let's pray. Father, we, we welcome you this morning. We thank you, Lord, for this time we can have together. And we ask, Lord, where we need to go, that you take us, what we need to see, that you show us, and that you would help us, Lord, to see the preeminent Christ that Paul talked about here in Colossians 1, and our hearts and our faith would be lifted to you out of our circumstances, Lord, out of our uh, darkness, out of our anxieties, out of our confusion, even out of our depression. Lord, we look to you. We thank you that you are with your people, and we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. I'm going to sing a familiar song that um, most of you know. Um, we have been sending the um, lyrics ahead in, in an email, so uh, if you check your email, uh, you'll be able to see a, a, a link or at least a, a, a list of the songs we're going to do this morning so that you can follow along the lyrics if you would want to do that. But this song is called By Faith. One, two, three. By faith we see the hand of God. By faith we see the hand of God. 
the light of creation's grand design. In the lives of those who prove his faithfulness, walk by faith and not by sight. By faith, our fathers roam the earth with the power of his promise in their hearts. Of a holy city built by God's own hand, a place where peace and justice we will stand. We will stand as children of the promise. We will fix our eyes on Him, our souls reward. Till the race is finished and the work is done, we'll walk by faith in When the long for Messiah would appear With the power to break the chains of sin and death And rise triumphant from the grave We will stand as children of the promise We will fix our eyes on Him, our soul's reward Till the race is finished and the work is done, we'll walk by faith and not by sight. By faith the church was called to go. By faith the church was called to go. In the power of the Spirit to the lost, to deliver captives, to deliver captives and to preach the news. This mountain shall be moved, and the power of the gospel shall prevail. For we know in Christ all things are possible. For all who call upon His name, we will stand as children of the promise. We will fix our eyes on Him, our souls reward. faith and not by sight. I hope you've enjoyed uh, Nate Carey's um, Saturday Night Songs with Nate as much as, as, much as that. That. And um, Nate shared a song in one of the first ones he did uh, called Everything at Calvary. And um, we asked Nate to share that with you this morning. So welcome, Nate. Welcome, welcome. Well, it's good, good to be together online this morning so I want to share a chorus that I wrote um, called everything at Calvary and and this is just a simple chorus that is a confession of faith and what we believe uh, you know as believers we need to believe something and so what we believe is that we find grace we find everything we need at Calvary and that that's what this song is about so I want to share that with you today And the strength of my faith 
say amen to that hey are we back i think we're back okay so you, you know what's funny is uh nate i have you playing like a minute behind me in the same room my family's watching so i was going with that <laughs> <laughs> sorry guys uh nate i love that song it's so soothing i uh, appreciate that um and you know what maybe you could uh turn that down because I'm going to be hearing me and me at the same time here, <laughs> just until I'm done giving announcements. Um, to my left, I have my family and uh, a family friend sitting around our computer watching, but it's a minute behind. So, um, all right, I would like to um, I would like to read another scripture from the same passage I I read from um, a moment ago, Colossians chapter one. I I, I started off today by reading Colossians. 1, um, 15 through 20. And now I'm going to go to the text right before Colossians 1, 15 through 20. I'm going to read verses 9 through 14. Paul writes, And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. May you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. 
you know, this text here mentions that we are qualified uh, to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. And this week, my son Jack got a, uh, a little Thor hammer fidget spinner that he ordered online. He was real excited to get it. And, and uh, it says on it, like, whoever is worthy can, can wield the hammer. And uh, the other day, Jack said, Dad, see if you're worthy. And uh, I preached the gospel to my son. I said, we're all worthy in Jesus Christ. So when we see stuff like this, it says, um, who has qualified us to share in the inheritance. We're qualified because of Jesus. We're qualified because of our faith in him, not our own worthiness or our own works, our own righteousness. So my poor son, Jack, got, uh, he got a fiery sermon, a great awakening sermon from dad. You're worthy too. We're all worthy in Jesus Christ. Um, so this, this text, though, like I said, it precedes the worshipful writings of Paul when he, right after this, he says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. By Him, uh, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, etc. And so um, Paul is making a connection to who we are based on who Jesus is. So when we, when we know Him, when we know Christ and who He is and what He's done, it explains us, doesn't it? It, it explains who we are. It's hard not to be together during this time. It's hard to be in social isolation. It's hard to watch the news these days. It's hard to look at what potentially is coming as there are already, you know, there are some who are predicting uh, more uh, uh, the pandemic to spread even right through the winter and all of that. But our encouragement today to you from this text is we want to encourage you to continue to connect with God's people we want to encourage you, as this text says, endure. We want to encourage you to persevere through hardship in faith. Persevere in the will of God for your life. Number three, Paul says, I'm praying for you. We want to encourage you to keep praying for one another. Paul transitions from this encouragement to God's people into the, the text, the passage of praise. We want to encourage you to be worshiping God. Surround yourself with, with worship and praise. Turn, it on, turn on worship music during the day. Uh, if you're not sure what to turn on, uh, we leave... Um, links to worship songs in the comment threads uh, of these uh, live streams. Uh, turn that music on. Turn your heart and your mind to Christ and let your faith rise. And then number four, we want to encourage you to continue to offer yourself as Paul does here. He, he offers himself to the Colossian people. He ministers to them. So offer, your, offer yourself to the Lord. And, you know, I was trying to think, is, is there a... Is there a um, a simple acronym I could use to help you know our church family remember this, and this is this is really terrible. But I, I think the kids will get it, and maybe the Star Wars nerds will get it. So Caleb will definitely get it. So the acronym I just gave you is C three P O. Okay, C connect, and then three P's persevere, pray and praise, and then O is offer yourself C three P O. So if you're trying to remember, well, what did Pastor Derek say on Sunday morning? Oh, yeah, that's right. He talked about C3PO. Connect, persevere, pray, praise, offer yourself to God. And maybe that just ruined the whole thing for you. <laughs> uh, helps a simple guy like me. Some announcements. Um, we uh, participated, some of us did yesterday, in the Compass Care Virtual Walk for Life. They had a simulcast going during the time slotted for the prayer walk in the morning. Uh, my wife and I and Reese and our dog got outside and... and uh, Walk for Life and listen to the simulcast. I got to say, uh, Jim Harden, the director of uh, Compass Care, his, his message uh, on Love Thy Neighbor was maybe the most powerful, um, poignant, um, pro-life message I've ever heard. And if, if, you, if you get a chance, go on to Compass Care. I think it's .org. Go to compasscare.org and, um, uh, and listen, to that, um, listen to that message. Uh, and I just got a I just got a, a text during this live stream from uh, our friend Josh Mayer who said Spider Man was not worthy. Okay, thank you for that, uh, pointing that out. That footnote to this this exegesis of this text. Um, the COVID nineteen benevolence fund uh, something we want to remind you about. Uh, that's something we set up to help families in crisis, um, starting with our church family, and then uh, we are open to meeting any needs that are brought to our attention from outside our church even though as the scriptures teach us, we want to make sure that we take care of our 
our own uh, congregation and church family first. And so if, if there are needs that you are aware of that you have uh, or that a, a, you know, a member of the body of Christ that you're connected to, that you're aware of has, we encourage you to go online uh, to the um, website and um, uh, gracelifeavon.com backslash giving and uh, to fill out the, the, the request form for that. Um, if you're nervous about doing that or you're uneasy about doing that, then just contact one of us. Contact me or, or Caleb uh, or your group leader and, and just let us know that you have need and uh, we can begin to uh, consider how we might help you and help one another during this time. We also encourage you to continue regular giving during this time. Uh, as the scriptures teach, to give cheerfully, not out of compulsion. Uh, we, you know, we don't want anyone guilt giving or feel like you know, God's not going to bless you. Uh, if you're in a time of financial crisis and you can't give like you normally give, please don't feel any condemnation around that. But we do want to remind you there are ways to give online during this time. In particular, if you go on our website, same uh, link I just shared with you, uh, backslash giving on our website, you can give to the PayPal and also you can uh, give through your online banking. And we appreciate that as we continue to have uh, needs as a church as we move forward. And then finally, we want to remind you that we have um, a little less than a week uh, to dialogue about the deacons that we, the potential deacons that we presented to you um, for installation. Um, normally, we would uh, give a vote of affirmation on these type of office ministries during a member meeting, but since we have not been meeting as a membership team and we felt the need to install at least some of the deacons during this time when there is so much need, uh, we wanted to move forward uh, maybe with this sort of creative uh, context that we have to install deacons. So if you have any thoughts, uh, encouragements, concerns uh, that you want to communicate to us as an eldership about any of these folks that we're presenting to you, please contact us in private um, between now and Thursday evening and, uh, and let us know what your thoughts are. If you do not communicate to us, we will uh, take that as a vote of silent affirmation uh, regarding the deacons that we would like to install uh, this Thursday night in our elder gathering. So the names we want to present, these are only some of the names as we intend to uh, install other deacons that have been in the training process as well along with these names. We intend to install others um, uh, soon as well, but these are the names we want to present to you right now. Ron Brancato, Dan and Elise Durkee, Mike and Pam Conklin, Suzanne Lee, Nicole Jones, Christina Kranz, Scott Muir, and Mike Tucker. So again, if you would be praying for them and communicating with us. If you have any thoughts, uh, we would appreciate that. Okay, I think I am good at this time. Uh, I want to welcome back uh, Caleb, who's going to be giving the word today. Caleb? All right, good morning. And uh, again, welcome to the Grace Life live stream. As uh, now we are entering into, I think, our seventh week on uh, social distancing and live streaming our, uh, our Sunday gatherings, or maybe we should call them scatterings, I don't know. Um, but yeah, seven weeks. In, in many ways, it seems like it's uh, been, I don't know, seven years? Feels a bit, a bit like that. So I, I eagerly anticipate and wait for the day that we can get together again and uh, worship together, and center our our lives around Christ together as a body, uh, not distanced, I'm tired of it. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so we've been looking at a series while we've been doing this, uh, live streaming from, from our homes, from our living rooms, uh, called Anchor. Uh, the tagline for it is secure in the storm. And we know it's been difficult. We all know it's it's been a trying time. We know that uh, in in many ways, uh, it is is felt extremely uh, lonely and and almost like a feeling of cut off from uh, people and and each other and your families. And so, you know, it's it's during the midst of something like that that we need to be anchored. We need to be secure. And so we're going to talk about that very thing this morning. Um, for something to be secure, there actually has to be something that has secured it. I don't know if you've ever gone fishing. 
Um, but if you've ever been in a boat and needed to drop the anchor, someone needs to drop the anchor. Someone needs to secure it. If you drop the anchor and it's not tied to a rope or a chain, you just lost an anchor. But if that anchor is secured and it's been secured by somebody in the boat, you can anchor and uh, your boat won't float away from your, your fishing spot. Um, I remember, this is totally off topic, but I, I can remember when I was, uh, I don't know, maybe 12, 13 years old, I was out fishing with my dad and I was always the guy on the anchor and uh, my dad told me to drop the anchor and I did. Don't worry, the rope was attached. Uh, but as we were fishing, I think I caught something and, and I needed to get the hook out and can't remember what exactly happened, but somehow, I, for some reason, I needed my dad's Leatherman tool, one of those multi-tool type things. And this was a really nice one that my dad had actually been given as a, a gift. Um, I dropped it in the lake. It slipped out of my hands and fell into the abyss of the lake. And uh, I, I, my dad didn't yell at me, but I could tell he was disappointed. And uh, so we continued fishing for a little bit, but eventually my dad's like, all right, let's, let's pull the anchor up, let's move on. And I began to pull the anchor up and I looked down as the anchor you know, came out of the water and there sitting on top of the anchor was my dad's leather man tool. And I just looked back at my dad and I said, hey dad, what, what would you say if I pulled up the anchor and the leather man tool was on it? And he was like, oh, you know, stop being silly. So I turned around and handed it to him. I think we were we were all shouting praises at that point, me especially. I didn't want to lose my life over a leather man tool. Um, but God is good. He cares even about your leather man tools. But we're talking about being secure today. We're actually been looking at Matthew 28, verses 16 through 20. And uh, the title for today's message is I Am With You. And as we look at this passage of scripture, uh, you probably have not read this passage and connected it necessarily to the ongoing COVID-19 crisis. Uh, but as I was thinking about what to share with you this week, uh, this passage actually stuck out to me. And um, especially that thought of for something to be secure, you need something to secure it. So as, you, as we unpack this message and as we look at this passage, I want you to look at what's being said by Jesus through the eyes of what you're going through right now. Connect the dots between where you are right now and what you're going through to what this passage is saying, okay? So let's, let's take a look at the passage first. Now the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. I had to turn the page. And when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Let's pray. Father, I just ask that as we open your word this morning, that you would open our eyes and our hearts and our ears to receive from you, Lord that you would just speak to us this morning, that you would encourage us in the midst of our, our trials. And Lord, mostly that our hearts would center on Christ in the midst of a crisis. Lord, that our hearts would find uh, their rest and their security in you, Lord. And uh, as, we, as we study this, I just ask that you would uh, pour grace into our hearts. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we're going to talk about three things today, especially. Um, uh, number one, authority. Number two, the promise. And number three, secure. That's authority, the promise, and secure. So as we start, we kind of get the stage set by verses 16 and 17. Um, now the 11 disciples went to Galilee. It says 11, but um, others have pointed out, you know, comparing to other passages of scripture, that there may have been more that went with as well. Um, but Jesus specifically, when he asked them to come to Galilee, was speaking to the 11 remaining disciples. Um, and they, they go to Galilee, and they go to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. And these two verses set the stage for what's happening. 
Jesus has risen from the dead and now tells the disciples to meet him in Galilee. And so they do. They go to him and worship. But notice that some doubt it. The word here for doubted in the Greek reflects hesitation and not necessarily a refusal of the truth. They didn't doubt whether he was the Messiah. They just were unsure how to respond to him. They were slow to come to grips with the fact that Jesus is the incarnate God himself. And so there's our setting. In verse 18, we see it says, and Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So as I said, as we began here, for something to be secure, something with authority and power needs to be able to secure it. This is the object that will hold my heart when the rest of my life is falling apart. I need something with power and authority. When the winds blow and the storms rage, and yes, when microscopic viruses take loved ones or friends or even my sense of security, when wars, famines, and maybe pending uh, economic uncertainty, and even persecution come. What or who will be strong enough to secure me? And when you look at things that people have anchored their hearts to uh, for that security, when you look at those things, you see why so many have lost hope. Your work, your employer, your teacher, your parents, your government, your schools, um, your stocks and financial portfolios, your life insurance policy, your cars, your, your uh, I don't know, the things that just make you feel stable, your loved ones, your family, as wonderful as many of these things are, all fail to provide lasting security because in the quickest of moments, they're gone. One of the things that I've seen, I don't know, maybe it's just a personal uh, opinion, but one of the things that I've seen happening in the midst of this pandemic is that we're seeing the effects of placing too high of a value on anything other than Christ. When we place a high value on these things, like our stocks and our portfolios and you know our, our, our diverse portfolios, whatever that means, um, when we look at our 401ks, when we look at um, the president, our governors, our mayors, if we look at our, our health institutions and, and all of these things for our hope, if we've put too high a value on those things, we see that in a moment, they're gone. We see that something as small as a microscopic virus that potentially came from a bat can take away our peace and security in just a few short weeks. All our treasures, all our securities, were nothing more than sandcastles waiting on the beach for the tide to come in and wash it all away. So we need something that is stronger, something with authority and power that will last in the midst of a storm. We need something that is solid. The Bible tells us to build our house on the solid rock. Because if we build on the sand, it will all collapse and wash away. So what is authority? Authority is the right to rule, to command, to govern. The Greek word exousia, which is translated as the English word authority in our passage, literally means that which arises out of being. It is the right to rule that arises out of the present conditions or state of being or relation in which one finds himself. So a father has the right to rule by virtue of the God-ordained relationship that the, God, that the father has to his children. Jesus has the right to rule by virtue of his present state of being or condition as the victor over sin, death, and hell. Jesus has authority because he is risen. He is the conquering savior. And what is the source of his authority? God the Father. So Jesus had authority in eternity past as well. 
But when he came as the incarnate God, he laid aside much of the expression of his deity and his authority and power in regards to um, all of that. He, he still was God. He was 100% God and 100% man. But when he died and was risen again, God gave him a name that was above all other names. He gave him authority and power above all. So Jesus has conquered. He has overcome because he has risen from the dead and has overcome death, suffering, guilt, and condemnation. And ultimately, Jesus has triumphed over Satan. Because of this authority, Jesus has disarmed the power of darkness. And what I'm about to say here is a, is a you know, put a little tab here or a little note here, um, because this is something you're going to need to remember. Uh, for your discussion and questions at the end. I'm giving this one away for free. Um, the only way that Satan can fight us is through guilt and condemnation. And in Christ, those weapons are removed. So Satan comes at you today empty-handed in his ability to destroy you. He still fights, but his weapons are not carnal, the word tells us. They're not flesh and bones. They're spiritual. And his main weapons are guilt and condemnation. And we feel that sometimes, right? And, you know, we battle with guilt. We battle with condemnation. But by the grace of God, Jesus has disarmed that authority. He's removed the guilt and condemnation. Romans 8 says that there is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So Satan comes at you empty-handed. And another way to say authority is sovereignty. What is sovereignty? Sovereignty is God's right and power to do all that he decides to do. What authority does God have? What is God sovereign over? What is Jesus sovereign over? Well, all things. Job 42 and verse 2 says, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. I love that. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. So what is God's purpose in something like a crisis? What is he trying to do in the midst of it? Well, to be honest with you, I don't know fully. I know God's ways, or I'm, I'm learning God's ways, I should say. I don't know them 100%, but in his word, I see God's ways. And in all things, God is trying to draw a people to himself with the gospel. He's, he's wanting us to see Christ and value Christ higher. So in the midst of COVID-19 and in the midst of crisis, you can guarantee that in suffering and in tragedy, God is doing something. He is drawing people to himself. The authority that Jesus has is unlimited. I, as Derek mentioned Star Wars, I'll mention Star Wars again, but I always remember uh, a line from Star Wars Revenge of the Stiff that always sticks out to me. And uh, ironically enough, they repeated it again in um, the newest Star Wars movie, Rise of Skywalker. But Palpatine, the evil bad guy, is on his back and he's shooting lightning out of his fingertips. And he says, unlimited power. He doesn't have unlimited power. He's also fictional. Uh, but Jesus does have unlimited power, unlimited authority. And it's not restricted by jurisdiction or geography. You know, it's interesting during times like this, when there's so much politicking going on, we've seen arguments over jurisdiction. Who has the authority to decide what in our country? And I'm sure in many other countries, if, if somebody's watching this from another country, it's probably the same. But here in America, we've seen governors going at it. We've seen mayors going at it. We've seen the president going at it. Everybody's going at it, right? They're all fighting between each other. Who is in authority over this? Well, Jesus doesn't have to fight anybody for jurisdiction because for him, it's in heaven and on earth. It's everywhere. Over all spiritual and material realms, realms he is sovereign. He's the high king of heaven. In ancient times, you would have all these little kings over different tribes and things like that. Um, and then there was the one high king who united them all as the, the king over these little kings. Well, Jesus is the ultimate king of kings. He is the high king of heaven. 
The word of God tells us that all things are subjected to him. We've looked at this in our morning devos that we've done on Facebook Tuesday and Thursday mornings at 11. Philippians 3, 20 and 21 says, but our citizenship is in heaven and from it we await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. And Philippians 2, 9 through 11 says, therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that as the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So Jesus has been given authority. He is sovereign, and he has conquered sin, death, and the devil. The Father has given him this authority. And I want to read one more scripture to show us that this authority encompasses all things. Ephesians 1, 20 through 23, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So in this authority, Jesus has been given a name that is above all names. Do you see his power and authority? One thing that stands out to me as well in that verse is that it's eternal. It's in the age, this age and in the age to come. Again, we keep seeing this as we've been looking at Philippians in the last few weeks of our live stream that we exist right now in the in-betweens. We are in this age, but there is an age to come. But Jesus is in authority over all of it. He's in authority over everything. And if you just heard some rumbling, it's because all of just ran through here. <laughs> um, as we look at this, I want to read something. Um, it's a list that was compiled by John Piper um, <laughs> nearly 20 years ago. And it just shows the things that the authority that Jesus has covered, what it covers. And ultimately, I think it's just scratching the surface. But bear with me as I read through this. All authority over Satan and all demons and all angels, good and evil. Authority over the natural universe, natural objects and laws and forces like stars and galaxies and planets and meteorites. Authority over all weather systems, winds and rains, lightning and thunder, and the effects like tidal waves, monsoons, floods and fires. All authority over molecular and atomic reality, atoms, electrons, protons, neutrons, subatomic particles, quantum physics, DNA, and chromosomal reality. All plants, all animals, doesn't matter what size, whales, redwoods, giant squid, the giant oaks, all fish, all wild beasts, he has authority over all. All invisible animals, bacteria, parasites, germs, and yes, viruses. He has authority over them. He has authority over all parts and functions of the human body. Every beat of your heart, every movement of the diaphragm, every little jump across a million synapses in your brain. Jesus has all authority over all those physiological phenomena in your body. He has authority over all nations and all governments, congresses, legislatures, kings, premiers, and courts. He has authority over armies, weapons, bombs, and terrorists. Authority over industry and business and finance and currency. All authority over entertainment, amusement, leisure, and media. All authority over education, research, science, and discovery. All authority over crime and violence in all families and all neighborhoods. Authority over his body, the church. And all authority over every soul in the universe, in every moment, and every second of every life lived, now or previously or forever and ever, anywhere in the universe. You hear that and you might be asking, okay, Caleb, I agree. God is sovereign. But what about suffering? What about all the panic? What about all the bad things that happen to good people? Why do good people die? 
why do economies crash? Why do governments take more control than they should? Or why do governments persecute Christians? These questions could go on and on and on. I've had discussions with friends of mine who have posed these type of questions. Could God create a burrito that was even too hot for him to eat? Ultimately, God is sovereign. God is in control. God uh, is in authority over all those things that we read. And yes, people suffer. And yes, people die tragic deaths. But the answer to why these things happen is not because God isn't sovereign. It's not because God isn't big or God isn't in control. The answer to why bad things happen is because of sin. Sin has consequences and it has effects. The ultimate consequence is death and separation from God. Romans 5.12 says, therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. But just because these bad things happen doesn't mean that Jesus has not received all authority in heaven and on earth. When we look at the natural things of this world, birth kind of stands out as one of the most normal, right? I was born. You were born. Olive was born. Chanel was born. We all were born. All of us who are here watching this live stream were born. Death will occur for all of us should the Lord tarry. Everyone dies. But there's something about death that just feels so wrong, whereas birth is normal. It, it, it's right. It feels normal. But death feels wrong. And that's because ultimately suffering, pain, and death are wrong. They are the results of sin. But take heart because Jesus has conquered those things and has begun to right them. And one day at the consummation of all things, death will be fully destroyed. <clears throat> Excuse me. First, I was looking through 1 Corinthians 15, and I kept seeing all these amazing promises of resurrection. And, and it just, I don't know, it stirred my heart. But I, I want to I encourage you to read the whole chapter of 1 Corinthians 15. But I want to mention verse 26. This promise that, we are given in verse 26. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Death has been defeated, and one day death will be removed. So that is the authority of Jesus. And we spent the most time on that for a reason. But how does this affect me in the midst of my storm right now? How does this huge theology of authority and sovereignty affect me in my personal circumstances? Little old me. Well, we have a promise. In verses 19 through 20, we see the promise. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Jesus tells the disciples that he has all authority. And he tells them the mission that they're on, the mission that we're still called to. In that authority, Jesus tells them to go, make disciples, baptize new believers, and teach them all that Jesus has commanded. And this is still our mission. And we're still under the authority of Christ. And it's in that authority that we can go forward and proclaim the gospel, that Jesus died, that he rose again. And for those who believe, we can proclaim the forgiveness of sins. This authority is our warrant to preach the gospel and to proclaim the forgiveness of sins to those who will believe. And normally this is the focus of this passage, right? When we talk about the Great Commission, we focus on the Great Commission, and rightfully so. But today we're not going to focus on that. Today we're going to focus on the promise. And there are three important parts of this promise that I want to share with you. Those, those important parts are, number one, who made the promise. Number two, the length of the promise. And three, the comfort of the promise. So who made the promise, the length of the promise, and the comfort of the promise? And we're going to go through those actually kind of quickly. We're not going to dwell uh, too long upon those. Uh, but what is the promise again? It's that line there when Jesus says, and behold, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. 
<clears throat> the one with the right and power over us has promised to always be with us. Wow. That is an incredible promise. The one who has all authority in heaven and earth will never leave you nor forsake you. And it's Jesus, the one with all that authority who has made the promise. So the answer who, who made the promise, well, it's Jesus, the one with all authority. Because it's Jesus and the, the authority that he has, we know that we can trust this promise. We can trust this promise. So what does always cover? Well, it covers at all times, good or bad, darkness or bright, prosperity or lack, comfort or suffering. He is with me. Hebrews 13, five through six says, keep your life free from love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? He will never leave us nor forsake us. So the length of this promise is eternal. And there's a big encouragement in the midst of that today. I, I know that we're all in different places when we consider what's going on. Some of us are, you know, maybe more afraid of the impact of the virus on, on our loved ones and health. Some of us are more afraid of the political ramifications or the economy. Some of us are uh, more concerned with um, the long-term effects of a government with this much power, no matter where you land in your thoughts on what this is, I want you to look at that last line of Hebrews 13, where it says, what can man do to me? Jesus is sovereign, not a political force, not the powers of darkness. So do not fear what they can do. The, finally, the comfort of this promise, as I mentioned in the three parts that uh, make up this promise. Um, this third part, the comfort of the promise, is tied intrinsically to the first two parts. And it's simply this because the one who made the promise has all authority, and because his promise is eternal and has defeated death, I know that this promise cannot fail. There is literally no way for it to fail. Even in my death, it fails not. In fact, death seems to prove it. Because as we transition from this life into eternity, this promise of being with Jesus forever and ever is realized as we enter into the presence of the Lord. So the worst thing that can happen to me is my death, right? I mean, that's pretty much the worst thing. But ultimately, as Paul has said in Philippians, to live is Christ, but to die is gain. Don't be afraid of death. I think sometimes we've, we've uh, I don't know, in, there's something missing in the church that <clears throat> we don't talk about death a lot. We don't talk about um, not fearing death. I just want to encourage you today, don't fear death. There's nothing in death to fear for those who love the Lord, for those who are called for those who are chosen, those who believe, there's nothing to fear. Jesus has authority. He has promised to never leave you nor forsake you. And therefore I can trust that I am secure. So this series is called Anchor. And ultimately we have aimed to show you that Jesus is, Jesus is the true anchor. He is what is holding us in the midst of the storm. Only Jesus has the power to secure us. I hope that you've seen that his authority uh, gives him the right and power to do so. I hope you see his power to hold you fast. I hope you see the promise that he has made and cling to it by faith. The most important thing that is secure in all of this is my eternal life. It is secure in Christ. So even if COVID-19 takes me out, or tomorrow I'm walking down the street and a bus drives off the side of the road and takes me out. I'm secure in Christ. Even if the economy tanks or some political force comes in and takes me because I preached the gospel of Jesus, I'm secure in Christ. 
And there's many passages of scripture that we could point to that lift our hearts in this and show us our security in Christ. But I just want to read a couple here. Romans 8, 39 and 30, 8, 8, 38 through 39, a passage we're all very familiar with. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Nothing can separate us from Christ. Nothing leaves room for nothing. There's no room for what about this? Nothing, nothing, nothing. We've seen this promise security in Philippians as well. Philippians 1, 6, for I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 1, 8 and 9 says, he will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And lastly, 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 and 24, may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. He will hold me fast. I don't have that kind of strength. He does. My faith is often very weak. But praise God that the one in whom I trust has all authority and power and has promised me with an unshakable promise that he will keep me. Amen. God is good. God is keeping you. You are secure in Christ. Let's pray. Father. I don't know who all is watching this this morning, but I just ask that for those who are, Lord, that you would just comfort and bring peace and bring a sense of security this morning as they're reminded of the, the words that Jesus spoke to us, that Jesus is with us to the end of the age, Lord, and that in him we are secure. If there's anybody watching this, Lord, who does not yet believe, I pray that your Holy Spirit would convict of sin and that you would grant them the gift of faith and repentance and that they would believe on the works of your son and have their sins washed away lord we give you praise and honor and glory because we know that it is you who has done this mighty work and that in the midst of our suffering and in the trials that we're in you are god and you are in control Help us to believe that. Help us to trust that. In Jesus' name, amen. So I have a few discussion questions to leave you with. Number one, what is the authority that Jesus has? And with that, what are its limits? Number two, what are we fearful of and how can I apply the promise that Jesus has made to that fear? And number three, what is the weapon that fights against my security? Will hint it was what I mentioned in the first point of this message. I hope that that has encouraged you. I hope that it has given you a renewed confidence in Christ and what he has done. And uh, going to bring the other guys back in. Actually, I have no ability to do that. So I just hope that Derek will bring the other guys back in um, as we, we wrap this up this morning. I'm glad to have been able to uh, share the gospel with you this morning and the tools that God has given us in, in uh, this technology to be able to do that. So welcome back, guys. Thanks, Caleb. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. All right. Well, appreciate that word, Caleb. So so rich, so encouraging. And uh, we encourage you now in your home uh, with your family, with your spouse, with your kids, or maybe you're with your, uh, your friends. I uh, encourage you to process this message with those questions. Um, and uh, if you're alone, uh, just meditate on these questions and uh, maybe call somebody uh, from your church family uh, now or later and, and uh, encourage one another uh, by dialoguing around uh, this word, uh, the authority, the promise, the security that we have uh, in Christ.
as he taught us in Matthew 28 in the Great Commission. I'm with you always. Also, we put some links to some songs in the comment thread. There's uh, two adult songs, one kid's song. So I encourage you to check that out as well. And you can use that maybe as you close your time of discussion and prayer with one another to uh, just think about um, all that's been said and, and processed with uh, music. Also, don't forget the 1 o'clock Kids Ministry live stream today with Chanel, 1 p.m. And then Tuesday and Thursday, Caleb and I will be back online with our Philippians uh, morning devotionals at 11 a.m. on both Tuesday and Thursday. And then Nate uh, has Saturday night songs with Nate, Saturday at 7.30. So uh, thank you. God bless you. If you need anything, please contact us. We love you. We're praying for you and uh, encourage you to pray for us and the rest of the congregation. So until next time, God bless you. And remember that Jesus is enough.